So I'm really happy to be a part of this conference. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing our first speaker today, um, Asia Stewart. Uh, Asia Stewart is currently based in New York where she works as a singer and performance artist. She is a national young arts winner um, in musical theater and former National Arts Policy Roundtable Fellow with Americans for the Arts. She recently concluded her first independent performance series entitled Graft, which attempts to capture the violence that constructions of whiteness and femininity wrought on black bodies that will never be enough. As a graduate of Cambridge and Harvard University, she is drawn to the concept of living archives and is currently directing her first documentary entitled By the Root on the lives of members of the Windrush generation. Thanks very much. I'm looking forward to your talk. I said good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone, everyone. Again, my name is Asia Stewart, and I just feel very lucky to be sharing virtual space with you all here today. Um, today, I'm going to try to provide a broad overview of research that I've been conducting for the past three to four years. Um, but before I begin, I just want to also extend my thank you to uh, Tiffany, Layla, and Jeffrey for including me in this conference and event. Uh, so today's presentation is entitled Invisibly Queer, Assessing Disparities in the Adjudication of U.S. LGBTIQ Asylum Cases Between the Years of 1995 and 2017. So I'm just going to be sharing my screen. And I would also be remiss if I did not credit the work and resources of the African Human Rights Coalition, American Friends Service Committee, Better Together New York City, DC Center Global, Freedom House Detroit, Immigration Equality, LGBT FAM, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, the National Immigrant Justice Center, the National LGBTQ Task Force, New York City Anti-Violence Project, Outright International, Physicians for Human Rights, and the UC Hastings Center for Ge Gender and Refugee Studies. So to begin. How do you tell a client that they lost their case simply because they are unlucky enough to receive the wrong judge? That's the question I was asked by an immigration lawyer concerning the current state of justice in the United States asylum system, a system defined by arbitrary case outcomes and gross disparities in judicial discretion. The lawyer continued, decision-making is subjective. There are judges that deeply care about asylum, but adjudicators are subject to their own personal biases. I don't know if that will ever change. Her words suggest that the outcome of asylum cases, which dictate whether claimants will be granted permission to enter into the United States or suffer deportation to countries where they endured persecution, is decided by nothing more than chance. In a separate interview, another lawyer states that case outcomes are wholly subject to the attitudes and ideologies of adjudicators. She states, there are some judges in New York where you can just walk into their courtroom and say your name and they will grant your case. But there are others that are just as likely to automatically deny the case. What am I supposed to do? If my clients don't receive asylum, they will most likely die. With the gravity of these cases in mind, it is deeply disturbing to learn that claimants' lives are determined by arbitrary factors, such as the predilections of the adjudicator who happens to be decided or assigned to decide a particular case. Several legal scholars have published articles within the past decade that offer evidence of notable variations in the decision-making between asylum officers, asylum offices, immigration judges, and the circuit courts of the U.S. Court of Appeals. The disconcerting degree of statistical variation exhibited by decision makers at all levels suggests that the, the results of asylum seekers' cases are strongly influenced by the identity of judges and by the location in which courts are heard. Extant literature demonstrates that an adjudicator's decision making tendencies are often determined by their race, gender, class, work experience, political ideology, and personal relationships. Adjudicators' multiplicity of identities, backgrounds, and life experiences then color the way that they view asylum claimants, interpret their narratives and testimony, and ultimately affect their pre-existing inclinations to grant or deny asylum. That means that before a case even lands on the desk of an adjudicator, before an asylum seeker even walks into a credible fear interview an asylum officer, in many instances, the outcomes of those cases are predetermined based on the identities of those receiving or audiencing their cases. This is particularly evident when analyzing how LGBTIQ asylum cases have been reviewed in the US. So the homophobia, transphobia, intolerance, prejudice, and ignorance of adjudicators shapes how they will interpret the merits of LGBTIQ asylum cases from the outset. Therefore, the outcomes of asylum seekers cases and lives are then dictated by the explicit biases and implicit biases of adjudicators. 
So this is not only an instance of having homophobic or transphobic judges, they're also so-called well-intentioned or well-meaning judges who do not understand the complexity of gender and sexuality and do not understand how they operate, or they're limited to the definitions of gender and sexuality that, that currently exist within the law. So it first became possible for queer asylum seekers to apply for asylum in the US in the early 1990s. And cases rest on the condition that claimants can successfully prove that they were the victims of past persecution or fear of future persecution due to their perceived gender identity or sexuality in their country of origin. The evidentiary standards of asylum cases essentially necessitate asylum claimants to essentially come out and provide proof that their gender identity and sexuality are authentic and credible. The standard significantly disadvantages claimants whose presentations of gender, sexuality, and gender and sexuality do not conform with the normative expectations of homosexuality and queerness, which are racialized, class, and culturally specific. And here in the US, they're often viewed through lenses that are often heteronormative and also homonormative. When I first started this project, I spoke with a former lawyer from Immigration Equality, a national LGBTQ immigration rights organization. He suggested that, US asylum, that the US asylum system is unwilling to accept LGBTQ asylum claimants that fail to be assigned or sorted into rigidly, rig, rigid socially constructed identity categories. In his email to me, he writes that asylum law works too strictly within LGBT taxonomies to the detriment of asylum seekers. So non-binary folks and people with fluid sexual identities are forced to pick a box to render themselves visible in the eyes of the law. So my research intervenes at this question of visibility, what happens when adjudicators are tasked to see LGBTIQ asylum claimants and whose presentations of gender and sexuality are deemed legible, whose identities are misunderstood, misread, or simply overlooked as invisible. Adjudicators make assumptions about what queer people look like as if the queer community is monolithic. Uh, so one of the lawyers I spoke with recalled an experience in which her client was challenged by an asylum officer who stated, you're telling me that you're obviously gay, but I have to tell you that you don't appear gay to me. Many adjudicators are inclined to recognize presentations of gender and sexuality that are quote unquote socially visible or socially distinct and familiar to them and thus ignore the ways in which asylum seekers presentations of gender identity and sexuality are informed by their own experiences. A human rights advocate bluntly equates this phenomenon of judicial discretion to an adjud adjudicator's application of a quote unquote pseudo legal gaydar. Gaydar, a portmanteau of gay and radar, of course refers to the colloquial term for one's ability to use stereotypes as well as verbal and nonverbal cues to identify whether someone is straight or gay just by looking at them. Anthropologist Siobhan McQuirk complicates this assessment and suggests that adjudicators consider questions beyond the veracity or authenticity of an asylum claimant's case for, um, for asylum. He tells me that it goes much deeper than a question of, do I believe you're gay? It's also a question of who is seen as vulnerable, who is viewed to be at risk. And that question is answered on a very gendered basis. With McCrick's words in mind, my article also interrogates this, this inquiry of who is perceived to be deserving of asylum and vulnerable and how is that assessment made? In an attempt to answer that question, this research builds upon legal scholarship to explore disparities in the asylum grant rates of adjudicators at different circuit courts in the United States. So this empirical research necessitated the creation of an original data set that includes um, almost all US Court of Appeals cases involving LGBTIQ asylum seekers from 1995 to 2017. So all the cases that are included in this data set involve claimants who were the victims of past persecution or fear future persecution due to their perceived gender identity or sexuality in their country of origin. Uh, so I have intentionally excluded cases involving heterosexual claimants who are HIV positive, as well as the cases of heterosexual claimants with an imputed homosexuality, as this work is mainly in, uh, concerned with the manner through which adjudicators read members of the LGBTIQ community. An analysis of this data set manifests major inconsistencies in the adjudication of federal appellate LGBTIQ as, uh, asylum claims. Additionally, it reveals disturbing evidence that the outcomes of asylum claims are subject to the personal whims, ideologies, preferences of adjudicators, leaving LGBTIQ claimants particularly vulnerable to adjudicators' subjective opinions of gender and sexuality. Uh, this data set accounts for a number of variables, including the year and court in which an asylum case was heard, as well as the asylum claimant's gender identity, sexuality, region of origin, HIV status, alleged criminal history, and status of counsel or legal representation. So through the use of uh, logistic regression, which I sort of hint to on this slide, I've sought to determine the influence of the aforementioned variables upon the dependent variable of case success. 
So when an asylum claimant's case is heard in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, as opposed to any other circuit court, the predicted probability of case success is 84.9% caterus paribus. The exceptionally high rates of case success in the historically liberal and quote unquote progressive Ninth Circuit contrasts sharply with the grant rates in the more conservative Fourth and Fifth Circuits, suggesting that, um, that there is adjudicator bias at play. Secondly, when an LGBTIQ asylum claimant identifies as a trans woman rather than as a cis woman or cis man, the predicted probability of case success is 85.4% caterus paribus. So this paper argues, and this research argues, that this disparity is grounded in one, adjudicator's conflation of gender and sexuality, and two, the assumption that the feminized body is more likely to be vulnerable and then just therefore deserving of asylum. Uh, until very recently in uh, case law, adjudicators were viewing and reading trans women as highly effeminate gay men. Uh, this only really began to change as of 2015. Uh, so the use of a mixed methods approach substantiates quantitative findings with the close readings of asylum case decisions and interviews with human rights advocates, law professors, legal practitioners, and including immigration lawyers. Ultimately, such qualitative evidence bolsters the claim that adjudicators are often misreading or misunderstanding LGBTIQ asylum claims, disadvantaging claimants who do not have quote unquote legibly queer sexualities or present the expected visual cues of queerness. So when I first attempted to explain this article's project to one of the lawyers I interviewed, she was very confused by my efforts to investigate the visibility of LGBTIQ, LGBTIQ asylum seekers in court. And so she straightforwardly asked me, um, how are you going to know how visible these claimants were when they applied for asylum? There's no way to know what they looked like in court. And I recognize that while I, be, I may be unable to physically observe the manner through which LGBTIQ asylum seekers presented their gender and sexuality in the courtroom, I can prioritize legal texts in order to understand how the state and its legal actors produce intelligible subjects when they interpret categories of gender and sexuality. The 226 case decisions that I have uh, included in my original data set offer glimpses of the scripts that have been performed by asylum lawyers to render their clients' gender and sexuality visible and legible within the courtroom. And I believe that the scripts that have been enacted by legal representatives to defend their clients are inscribed within the documents of federal appellate court cases. So court cases and opinions can be read as textual remnants that preserve both the narratives that asylum claimants and lawyers have sought to amplify in the courtroom for specific reasons, and they also show the ways in which adjudicators audienced and received those narratives through case results. I acknowledge that the law reproduces the asylum seeker as a disembodied legal subject and wish to frame the voices of asylum seekers as the focal point of my work. Although asylum seekers are at the center of these cases, they are only able to describe themselves in the prescribed terms of the court. And so the absence of asylum seekers grows more uh, pronounced as cases are appealed. So you have cases that are taking place at the level of immigration courts. Some of those cases are appealed to the BIA or the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then the cases that I'm evaluating have been appealed all the way up to the Court of Appeals, the Circuit Court of Appeals in the US. Um, and so the absence of the bodies and voices of asylum seekers from legal texts is particularly striking because these cases are centered around their bodies and voices. Uh, and the bodies of, bodies of asylum seekers are often the most critical sources of evidence and claims for asylum and externalize the trauma that claimants carry. Uh, so while I note that the voices of asylum seekers are routinely silenced throughout the institution of the US asylum system, following the words of Spivak, I hope to measure silences and transform those silences into the object of investigation. And so much of my work is not only looking at the data, but also looking at um, what is unsaid or unseen or unreported. Uh, so I want to move on to some of the limits now of uh, my quantitative uh, sample. Uh, so approximately 5% of US claims are based on persecution of um, sexual orientation or gender identity, which means that thousands of LGBTIQ, LGBTIQ asylum claims are filed each year. Um, and although the Department of Homeland Security or DHS processes and collects data on asylum applications, the agency does not record the gender or sexuality of asylum applicants. They actually record very little associated um, um, with cases. So the records only report the broadest categories of persecution upon which claims are based. Uh, so it's therefore really impossible for anyone to say uh, the number of asylum cases that have been made per year that either cite anti-LGBT persecution or have been submitted by people who identify as LGBT. So consequentially, in constructing this data set, it was necessary for me to use multiple legal databases such as FastCase, LexisNexis, and Westlaw uh, to compose the set. 
Um, and moving forward, um, I'm gonna sort of fast forward now because I'm probably gonna run out of time here. Um, but I do wanna also acknowledge that these cases are quite different um, from the overall set of cases because these are cases that have been appealed for a very particular reason up to the Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, but yet with that in mind, a lot of the Circuit Court of Appeals cases serve as presidential cases um, that ultimately um, can be cited in lower courts. So they're quite significant and quite important. So to qualify for asylum, an individual must demonstrate a well-founded fear of persecution on account of either race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, PSG, or political opinion, or the, you know, some combination thereof, the five. Uh, and the BIA um, over time has sort of um, not really been able to pin down what it means to be a member of a particular social group. Uh, so at various points in time, that definition has relied um, or you know, been contingent upon one's social visibility, as I hinted earlier, so being part of a socially distinctive group. Uh, the BIA has also stated that PSG membership uh, must be related to innate characteristics like race or nationality or characteristics that can, cannot or should not be required to change. So the standard of immutability reinforced by the concept of PSG membership, therefore constructs gender identity and sexuality as very rigid fixed traits, when in reality, both are quite fluid and can change and evolve over time. Um, Andrea de la Masa Perez Tamayo argues then that the concept of immutability produces the transgender body as inconceivable and invisible, ignoring the notion that individuals can transform or alter their gender identity. Um, so here I just wanted to provide some early examples of some of the first cases that are not only included in my data set, but also were sort of monumental cases in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I'm focusing here particularly on cases involving trans claimants or claimants that I'm reading now as trans that were not read as trans, at, um, you know, claimants who were not read as trans at the time. Um, and so one of my key arguments um, that I'm making today is that when or one of the key um, sort of conclusions of this work is that when uh, trans women um, who um, are the only trans claimants in included in this body of work, there are no trans masculine um, claimants whose uh, cases have been appealed up to the US Court of Appeals. So when trans women generally his and historically have had cases, they are being read as highly effeminate gay men instead of as trans women. And in instances when they are identified to be trans women, their cases are then denied. Uh, so these were just sort of included these to sort of demonstrate some of that. So in the case, 1995 case of Miranda versus the INS, um, Gina Ricardo de Miranda um, was viewed as a quote unquote uh, transsexual born male, um, but who always believed uh, she was female. And that case was denied. Um, five years later, the very important case of Hernandez Montiel versus the INS uh, in 2000 in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, in this case, uh, both uh, lawyers and also adjudicators used uh, masculine pronouns to refer to Hernandez Montiel. And this term uh, here that I have here of a gay man with a female sexual identity becomes cited in law. It's, not, it's cited, first cited here and persists in, in the law for the next maybe seven to eight years. Um, and this case is granted. And sort of following this case, we see similar patterns here. Um, so I'm going to come back to that, but I first sort of want to close in focusing on uh, some of the outcomes of the uh, logistic regression equation. So in this data set, uh, success is coded as a dichotomous dependent variable, where zero is equal to case failure and one is equivalent to case success. Successful cases are defined as all cases that result in the Circuit Court of Appeals granting the asylum applicant's case petition for, for review. So such successful cases include those that are remanded back down to the BIA and IJ, as well as cases in which the circuit court vacates or reverses the decisions of lower courts or affirms the position of the asylum seeker. Case failure refers to cases that were ultimately denied or dismissed by the US Court of Appeals or cases in which the BIA ruling against the asylum seeker uh, was affirmed. Uh, all variables in this data set are actually dummy variables. Uh, and so they've been coded as either zero or one for each case. Uh, so, for example, with respect to gender, each claimant uh, has been categorized as either male, female, uh, or trans on binary. And this act of coding was particularly difficult because it required that I read against the way that claimants were described or sorted by adjudicators or lawyers. Uh, it was also difficult because I think that queerness and queer subjects defy categorization, uh, which is why there's this inherent conflict, I think, between queerness and the law. 
And in some respects, my attempt to derive a statistical analysis of LGBTIQ cases reproduces some of the same taxonomical work that the state participates in. Uh, and it's also, as I was referencing before, some of the cases, uh, many of these cases, the claimants I've identified as being trans were not referred to as trans originally in the text, even when they insisted that they were women. And so now focusing on some of, of the main findings here. Um, so I follow the same manner of logic for um, all the other subsequent dummy variables. So this is around sexuality, region of origin, HIV status, legal representation, and alleged criminal history. Uh, and the variable that I really want to pay particular attention to here is the slide I just peeked a view at, which is the slide for um, where the circuit courts are located and how they're numbered across the country. Um, so there are uh, 12 circuit court of appeals, um, but I'm not including the DC circuit because the DC circuit doesn't have jurisdiction over asylum cases. And so due to the organization of US circuit courts, courts are subject to regional differences, including differences in geography and demography. Uh, so for example, it is highly likely that more um, asylum cases are filed in major coastal um, urban cities, such as New York City, Miami, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And therefore court regions with a higher concentration of urban areas will review more cases than um, courts um, that are located in more rural locations. Um, also, just looking here um, at how um, states or the existence of either sort of quote unquote pro LGBT laws or quote unquote anti LGBT laws, which can also, we can sort of complicate that later is, is how those are, can also function as being quite normative. But if we look at the, where the Ninth Circuit is located out here in the West, um, this, uh, this number, the states that have um, the highest number of quote unquote pro LGBT laws are located in the Ninth Circuit, which is again, the circuit um, that is quite significant uh, in this data set. Uh, and here, so the next slide here illustrates a number of cases that have been, have been classified as uh, successful um, cases or failed cases by year. And so clearly the number of LGBTQ asylum cases heard at the US appellate courts has increased uh, within the past two decades, um, rising steadily after 2003. Um, and despite the increase in the number of cases overall, success rates have remained pretty static. Uh, as illustrated on the next slide here, female claimants had the lowest proportion of successful cases in comparison to male and trans claimants. Uh, in fact, 22% of cases involving male claimants were successful, while only 14% of cases involving female claimants were successful. Over 56% 56, 56 um, of cases involving trans claimants were successful. And of the 49 published cases involving LGBTIQ claimants, approximately 71% of them involve male claimants, while only 10% uh, and 18% involve female claimants and trans claimants, respectively. Uh, cases involving lesbian and bisexual claimants also have lower proportions of case success. Uh, so as shown here, only 14% of cases involving bisexual and lesbian claimants have been successful. And the proportion of case success for gay claimants has been considerably higher at 23.2%. Uh, and the number of gay claimants in the, in the data set far surpasses the number of bisexuals or lesbians. And so the proportions of case success may not be that illuminating as illustrated there. With respect to region of origin, uh, in this set, uh, data set, Mexico is a country of origin uh, with the highest number of asylum claims, and a large number of cases involved claimants from Indonesia, Jamaica, and Colombia as well. Uh, notably, three of these countries are located in uh, the area that I've termed as Latin America and the Caribbean. And interestingly, cases from that region actually have the highest proportion of case success. Uh, so here, I just want to illustrate in this table, um, overall, though, um, rates of case success didn't really vary that much by region. And so we can see here 26% of asylum claims, claimants from Eastern Europe were successful, and 23% of asylum um, claims from uh, Africa, and 13% of asylum claims from the Asia Pacific region were successful. A uh, predominant proportion of claimants in this data set were represented by a lawyer in their petition for asylum, and that's to be expected because it would be incredibly difficult um, to appeal your case up to the level of the US Court of Appeals without some form of legal assistance. Uh, and it's also quite understandable then that with those who have representation, um, we're much more likely to have uh, or experience case success. Um, with respect to HIV status and claimants HIV status, I was actually surprised to note that uh, claimants who were HIV positive actually had, um, there was a slightly higher proportion of, pos of successful cases for claimants who were HIV positive. I was expecting to see that, you know, there'd be some sort of association 
um, around fear of quote unquote contagion that's often been associated with queer claimants reflected in case outcomes. Um, moving on here to uh, overall court outcomes. Uh, the large disparities uh, in case success confirm um, that there are differences uh, between how cases are viewed at various uh, US circuit courts. So for example, if we look at the fourth and fifth circuit here, there has never been a successful LGBTQ asylum case made there. Um, and then you know, look, thinking about the second, third, ninth, and 11th districts, those uh, circuits actually had the highest concentration of claims. Of the 226 claims included in my data set, over 24% of them have been heard within the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And approximately 45% or nearly half of all of the LGBTIQ asylum claims heard in the Ninth Circuit were amended or reversed. And this extremely high reversal rate is an indication of some aberration. Either the lower courts in the Ninth Circuit are poorly adjudicating LGBTIQ, LGBTIQ asylum claims, necessitating their review or reversal, um, or the Ninth Circuit is illustrating the failure of other circuits to offer LGBTIQ claimants due process and fair review of their claims. Um, so I know I'm short on time, but essentially what I've done here is uh, I replicated the same model in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and these were um, the following sort of significant variables. Uh, again, um, one of the first variables that was significant was the variable um, associated with gender um, for trans claimants. And so when, it, when an LGBTIQ uh, asylum claimant identifies as trans in the Ninth Circuit, the predicted probability of case success there is 85.4% uh, cateris paribus. So basically, like, what do all these numbers mean and why are they important? Um, I think that, one, this is clearly demonstrating that there um, is a disparate process of review existing um, across the US and particularly at the level of the uh, US Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and without, you know, this is something that we've known like in the literature and it's something that adjudicators have known and something uh, that lawyers have known for quite some time, but we've never had uh, really any, any way to show or document the magnitude of that difference in those claims. And so it's my hope that continuing one minute, quantitative Asia. work Thanks. That continued quantitative work uh, can can help provide a way to um, give uh, give space to folks who've often been, you know, considered undefined in data sets or haven't been included in data sets at all. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. That was that was really fascinating. Um, um, we're gonna have to save our questions. Yes, right. Claps. <laughs> Um, we'll save our questions um, for the end, um, but for now, I will turn to my introduction of Marina, Marina Shevstova, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Gender Studies Department at Lund University in Sweden. She's a PhD in political science from Humboldt University, Germany, and since 2017, she's been actively engaged in LGBTI rights activism as program coordinator for Turgo, a uh, Kyiv-based NGO working for a safe school environment for LGBTI students. Her research interests cover LGBTI activism, Europeanization, queer migration, anti-gender movements, and right-wing populism in Central and Eastern Europe. So thanks, Marina. Thank you very much, Lauren, for uh, introducing me. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for coming today. Uh, just a second. I will Wonderful. Okay, uh, so today I will be talking about the project I've been working since um, uh, fall 2018, and that's the project on queer mobilization and search for belonging uh, among uh, LGBTQ migrants. And initially, the project was on LGBTQ um, migrants in the US and in the EU member states, particularly on Sweden. But Corona uh, kind of made my field work. Uh, a little bit difficult and challenging and even though I still managed to conduct some interviews here I decided today also for the sake of uh, time uh, to focus on the US and this will be uh, the talk on LGBTQ migrants from particularly from Ukraine in the USA and about the ways in which um, they are either engaging or choosing not to engage uh, with uh, political mobilization with activism with LGBTQ activism and so far uh, just a little bit of a context, um, every year hundreds of Ukrainians and maybe even more who self-identify as LGBTI people 
ask for asylum uh, or migrate to the EU member states and the USA due to their sexual orientation and gender identities as the main factor or among other factors making them um, uh, take the decision. Uh, the difference between uh, these two parts of the world is that uh, since recently, the EU considers Ukraine a safe country for LGBT plus people. And in principle, um, we, we might say that it is so. Ukraine has some legal acts that actually uh, formally declaratory protect LGBTI people from discrimination at workplace. We have uh, public security services at uh, marches of equality in Kiev. Uh, there are more than 40 officially registered LGBTI rights organizations in Ukraine. So formally, you can say that a person who uh, do not disclose uh, too actively uh, their identity can probably live relatively safe uh, in Ukraine. And this is why it is extremely difficult to get uh, asylum in the European Union uh, being an LGBTI plus Ukrainian. And this is why the uh, migration, the queer migration uh, to the, uh, uh, in the direction of the West changed significantly in the last 10 years and more and more people are actually going to the US uh, simply because the USA still seems to grant asylum to LGBTI plus Ukrainians, even though uh, now, of course, the process slowed down. And even though, as the previous uh, presentation clearly shows, uh, this is uh, not, nothing, um, this is not a fantastic place to be. And this is not that easy to get asylum if you, um, if you are an LGBTI person and you go to the US hoping for that. Anyway, uh, that's true that there is a big wave of migration and different kinds of migration from Ukraine of LGBTQ people uh, to the USA. And uh, important fact that I have to mention in the context of my presentation is that in Ukraine, after anti-governmental protests in 2013-14, Euromedan protests, there is significant growth of nationalism and a different kind of nationalism that is uh, a topic for research per se, but uh, it is very important also for LGBTQ rights and LGBTQ community and mobilization. So here's my research puzzle. What I became interested is, uh, in uh, is uh, that I saw that uh, uh, within a uh, queer community, within, within LGBTQ community, Russian-speaking LGBTQ community, because Ukrainians are mostly also Russian speakers, Russian is a second uh, non-official, but uh, second speak spoken language in Ukraine, Ukraine being the only official one. Uh, so within that community, there is separate activism, separate kind of activism of queer Ukrainians that, um, and some of whom uh, uh, chose to uh, or to create their own organizations and chose to unite in their own kind of activism, deliberately separating themselves from either uh, just Russian community or from from Russian uh, Russian speaking community, so to say itself. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is some LGBTQ migrants decided to leave political activism. Others decided to join or initiate it. Uh, some changed the ways, the forms of activism they used to be engaged in while they lived in Ukraine and what, are, what they're doing now when they are in the United States. So I was curious about what are the motives behind those decisions? Why they make these decisions? What is What are the reasons? What, how are they thinking about this? And then how important actually being Ukrainian becomes in this story. So wh why are these national costumes are coming into the picture? Why are there sometimes national symbols and national flags are in, uh, are, you know, in the in the performances that they, that they make? And with all this, I, um, I went into the field. So method, my method was, this is a quote again, uh, unlike the previous uh, presentation, this is a purely qualitative study. Uh, these are uh, more than 20, around 25 semi-structured in-depth interviews with LGBTQ asylum seekers from Ukraine in the USA. And uh, they all live in big cities. Uh, these are, those are New York, Chicago, Miami, Los Angeles. And important fact, 90% uh, of the people I interviewed are cisgender gay men. Uh, I did ethnography also, I did participant observation, and for the last year and a half, I also did digital ethnography, following different groups, chats, uh, YouTube uh, videos, uh, different uh, um, uh, online events. And altogether, this, uh, this story, this research covers the period from fall 2018 to spring 2020. I will uh, jump straight to the findings uh, because of the time limits. And uh, if you have more questions about the ways, uh, the method, about the research, I will be happy to address those in Q&A. So I, did, uh, I divided findings in three broad topics. 
and that's how I want to build the uh, the article coming out of uh, uh, this piece of research. And the first one is about how this. Uh, people, how these migrants, both asylum seekers and people who migrated using different schemes, even though this is still forced migration, how they are defining activism. Uh, and uh, I found several different uh, definitions or groups um, of definitions that I list here. And one of them is defining activism as giving back. So initially when I was uh, interviewing uh, my respondents, uh, what I had in mind talking about activism, I meant, you know, the different visibility events, uh, I meant organized, semi-professional, professionalized activism. Uh, but uh, what many respondents actually mentioned as activism, they meant uh, such things as basically providing shelter in their own places, giving money to, have, uh, to people, and um, basically doing to newcomers to the US the things that uh, somebody else did to them. An interesting fact about uh, many Ukrainians, many uh, Ukrainian uh, LGBTQ uh, asylum seekers, and maybe I would rather say uh, cisgender gay men, is that uh, going to the US, many of them didn't have at all money, they weren't prepared at all. Uh, and, and this is interesting combination because this is a difficult process to A, get, get a visa, uh, American visa for a Ukrainian person, and then to, you know, to have money to, to travel there. But then at the same time, um, many of them uh, barely spoke English. They had literally like $200 and they uh, didn't have any idea of how to look for jobs. So what is the situation there? They just went there because they knew someone who knew someone who happened to have a free bed. A bed. And then, you know, uh, they spent at this bed and this couch uh, for uh, several months. Uh, then uh, maybe they started earning some money somehow. Um, and, and then when, once they had some, some uh, established life, um, they chose to start giving back to other people and uh, to help other people come into the US and they call it activism. So that's how they define activism and this is an important uh, part of life for them. And uh, uh, then a second part of this, of course, will be who they choose to help, who are those people who they choose to help and, you know, to let enter their houses. Second, um, uh, a second definition or second statement that I came across from several people is uh, the statement from people who, are, who decided not to do any activism and who think that activism is actually something that only citizens of the country are entitled to. So the argument is uh, that uh, while they lived in Ukraine and they were citizens of Ukraine, they had the right to demand certain things from their state. And they felt that they were, if they were to advocate for their own rights, uh they they were they were expected to do so so if you want to, to get rights you go and take them in your country once you go to another country host country the us in this case you are not entitled for any political activism being on uh, uh on vague right there so to say uh in undefined status uh and uh, people i talked to were in in very different status with with this position there were people who already were granted asylum where people uh undocumented and uh, people who uh, were in the process of uh, when the documents were still you know waiting uh, to be considered another uh, definition of activism or another approach to activism was activism as a way of coping with new life conditions so some people have chosen to engage in um, organized activism going to community meetings to go to, to to participate in ukrainian group at the pride parade in new york to participate in different photo shoots to create this picture of uh, normal uh, normal LGBTQ families, uh, uh, Ukrainian LGBTQ families in the US. Uh, I will uh, talk about those uh, also separately uh, as a way of uh, creating a community for themselves and coping a, a strategy to, you know, to, to do something in life, to do something that helps you to stick to certain life routine, to have some obligations, to not only do low qualified jobs because you, uh, for, for which you are, um, too, too, too highly educated, but still you have to do those. So for them, uh, this, this kind of activism was uh, merely keeping themselves busy in a nice way uh, and doing something that required creativity that uh, has friendly, to have friendly faces around them and so on. And finally, there are people, there are people who, act, who define activism as a natural continuation of their work from previous life. So they are professional activists 
who are not having plans to change their profession once they're in the US and um, they simply want to continue working in uh, NGOs and uh, nonprofit sector and maybe even having ambitions to once they go through all the stages making it to the uh, American politics. Uh, second uh, uh, group of findings I relate to the way how uh, these people redefine national identity or how they're questioning their belonging. And here, of course, um, one has to understand the complex context of Ukraine, which is a post-Soviet Republic, and uh, people who are coming from many regions of Ukraine, uh, which were predominantly until recently Russian speaking, these people for a long time uh, had this mixed uh, Ukrainian post-Soviet uh, Slavic Russian speaking identity. And if you compare people who uh, migrated or who went to the US, fled to the US um, before 2010, and those who uh, came later, um, you know, these two decades have very different, uh, have, have, has very, have very different groups of people because people who uh, went earlier are more likely to, uh, to identify, to mingle with a Russian speaking community, don't, not, not to have this. Uh, strong uh, nationalist ideas, uh, not to speak Ukrainian deliberately or even forgetting sometimes Ukrainian, you know, struggling with speaking Ukrainian. While the more recent come, uh, the people who came more recently, they actually uh, choose to identify as Ukrainians and uh, separate themselves from other post Soviet nations. On the other hand, uh, another another interesting question is how, how these uh, people are, uh, in which relation they are with Ukrainian diaspora. And here, interesting moment is that Ukrainian diaspora in big cities is often central around the, uh, focused on uh, around the church, and uh, sometimes around several churches. And uh, this, of course, doesn't doesn't work very well with uh, being an LGBT person. So uh, people usually people uh, who are coming from uh, a non-Western part of Ukraine, which are usually uh, more Russian speaking and less religious. Uh, they choose actually uh, to uh, stay away from Ukrainian diaspora because a uh, the Ukrainian diaspora might be very much Ukrainian speaking, might be very religious, and of course pre uh, pre presupposedly homophobic. While for some people coming actually from Western Ukraine, it was um, an option to even hide their uh, homosexuality, to hide uh, the way they are, just to be able to to talk to people uh, from their. Uh, from the community similar to their homes, uh, who speak same language, who have same traditions, even though it means for them again, you know, coming to where they came from, uh, hiding again who they are. Another thing is there, I found this gender variable that needs to, I need to, to dig deeper there because uh, the most inf information that I got was from cisgender gay men, simply because uh, they, that's uh, uh, the um, um, members of whom the Ukrainian activist community is, you know, formed in the cities and the argument that I got from them, so not from uh, lesbian women uh, uh, or trans women who uh, migrated or fled to the US. So the argument coming about that or justification for that coming from Ukrainian gay men is that Ukrainian women choose to uh, choose to uh, focus more on integration, they come better prepared, they have different coping strategies, allegedly. and. Um, and they, and they choose to find partners among locals and uh, 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 to, to uh, become uh, integrated as soon as possible and as well as possible. Uh, however, I would, wouldn't be making, of course, uh, statements based on these comments until I, uh, I make at least uh, some, some more detailed research uh, also with female participants. And as I mentioned already, a regional factor where the person is coming from, uh, from Ukraine uh, also played a role. And now the third part, um, all my findings was uh, uh, that activism for some queer migrants became a strategy, uh, the strategy of uh, actually um, uh, becoming politically visible and uh, uh, building political career and, uh, you know, having potential or building a potential to, as I said, enter American political life. And to that, uh, the approach is very, uh, very professional and very strategic. So this is um, Find, uh, finding, uh, organizing, um, 
how to say it, uh, to, you know, starting launching organizations that are formally registered, that go through all the stages of uh, formalities and bureaucracy in the US. That is fighting for increase of visibility. So together with uh, the normal, the, the everyday work of uh, such organizations, such as providing legal help, such as uh, yeah, psychological support, uh, you name it, uh, socialization events. It's also, uh, you know, uh, fighting for a niche and uh, for a space to create this visibility and to have this visibility associated with Ukraine and with Ukrainian democratization processes. And for that, uh, another interesting thing is that these organizations are trying to build connections with Ukraine and they try to contribute to the idea of uh, normalization of homosexuality in Ukraine and building this picture of uh, happy queer family uh, in or happy LGBT family in the US, Ukrainian family with uh, with two partners, maybe a kids or a dog, very normative in a way of how, how they picture it. And, and then, of course, they have these success stories of how um, how uh, these Ukrainians, they come, they came to the US, how they found uh, their true love there or they found uh, maybe American or a person from different nationality and how they build this family and live the American dream. And this is another interesting, interesting topic to um, to address uh, deeper. Now, uh, my final slide, uh, and I will be try, I will try to be on time. So, what, these are the questions I have for further discussion and for the research. So, one thing that I already pointed out is this difference between LGBTQ migrants and refugees who left the country before and after 2010-14, and the way how they uh, how they approach their nationalities, their national belong, belonging, their ethnicity then gender difference definitely needs to be addressed. And it was very difficult to reach for uh, uh, trans refugees and tra trans asylum seekers from Ukraine there um, uh, in the US. Um, I, I had more success in, in, in the EU member states with that. Uh, another important fact that most of the people of activists who are activists in the professional uh, uh, terminology. So people who, are, who go to marches, people who you know write petitions, who create uh, Facebook events who create uh, YouTube video, they already came prepared, they already were politically active in Ukraine and they equipped with knowledge, they write grant applications, uh, so they choose this as uh, being their profession. And finally, the interesting fact is this power competition for building network with other Russian speaking LGBTQ migrants. So apart from Russian community and Ukrainian community, there are of course people coming from Georgia, from other Eastern European countries from and from Caucasus. And uh, these are the groups uh, for which uh, now the power competition is between uh, some leaders. And of course, uh, each group uh, wants them for themselves. And uh, here to finish, this is a picture from last year. Was it last year, right? 2019, uh, seems like forever. Um, uh, the uh, global, uh, the world pride events uh, in New York, and there was separate uh, group of Ukrainians called Proud Ukraine, one of the of two Ukrainian organizations. And you can see their Ukrainian flags, Ukrainian traditional costumes. And if you see on the left, there is also the Georgian flag and uh, representative of Georgian group. So the last moment, Ukrainian group managed to get uh, Georgians on their group rather than uh, having them marching with the Russians. And of course, Ukraine and Georgia the two countries that have military conflicts with Russia. And uh, here you have this uh, pink poster saying, uh, uh, giving abbreviation for Putin, uh, fuck off. And um, uh, this is, you know, this is uh, also very, uh, very symbolic. So on that, uh, I will stop. And um, yes, I hope I was good with time. Thank you very much for, for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, that was great. Um, but we are kind of uh, out of time here. So if if everybody would maybe want to join me in um, thanking our panelists um, for really um, such impressive work um, and such fascinating topics. Um, we're really, really pleased you were able to share them with us today and be part of the uh, Queer Migrations Conference. So thank you very much. Well, <laughs>